Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, God. Good morning, Holy Ghost. Good morning, Jesus. Good morning, trials. Good morning, tribulation. Good morning, victory. Good morning, defeat. Good morning, long suffering. Good morning, grace. Good morning, mercy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, my God, my God, my God, my God. Yes. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, hail King Jesus. Oh, hail King Jesus. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Bless your name, God. Hallelujah. Oh, my God. Oh, hold my mule, God. Oh, my Lord. Amen, amen. We're so excited that you are here. We'd definitely like to welcome those of you who are joining us online. My we Lord. realize that you could have chose any place to worship, but you chose to worship with us, and for that we are so grateful that you chose us this morning. So thanks for joining us. Listen, God gave us a theme at the Woo. beginning of the year, and that theme is commit. Yes. To commit means to be determined to be in agreement with the Lord. It means to obligate yourself to righteousness. It means to make a pledge. It means assurance, loyalty, bond, education, duty, reliable, I'm prophesying this over your life, accountability, yes, presentation, Lord. obligation, a person, the Holy Ghost, it's a promise. To commit means to be about a mission, to be about the Lord's business, to be responsible about the things of the Lord, to be responsible, to be responsible, to be responsible, to be a professional, to be engaged, to manage your life, dedication, faith, trust, leadership, commit. I'm turned all the way up this morning. Yes, Lord. So if you can't take it, I am not going to apologize. But I have a victory on the inside of my belly. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm going to try to flow with you, Pastor Gary. It is the month of Adar. If you've been visiting us on Wednesday nights, we have prepared for the month of Adar. And the, 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 um, the, the book is the book of Esther. Esther went after the Amalekite spirit. Esther went out of the spirit that will cause people to be depressed and despondent, to be anxious. We are killing that demon for the next 30 days. I declare and decree in the name of Jesus victory in the month of Adar. I pray that your spirit man will catch the wave of what God is doing prophetically in Jesus' name. Amen. Commit. Commit. God also gave us a scripture to go with our theme for the year, and that scripture is found in uh, Psalm 37, 5. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass, and he shall bring forth righteousness as the light and thy judgment as the noonday. Amen. So God gave us that theme, commit, Holy and the, uh, we started off in the beginning of the year by telling you to commit to integrity, and uh, we started a sermon series called Please. Commit to Love, and we're going to continue in that sermon series today because not only do we want you to commit to integrity, but we want you to commit to love. And last week, we, we were in the book of John, and this week, we're going to be in the book of John again, but I want to bring something to your attention. Let's go to John 15. John 15. John 15, Come we on. studied this passage uh, last week, and we're going to be in that same vein uh, this morning. John 15, uh, verse 12. John 15 and 12. This is my commandment, my instruction, my ultimatum, my final demand, that you love one another as I have loved you. Mm -hmm. You know, it says, this is my commandment. Uh, Pastor Lane said, my final demand. Now, we shared with you last week that Jesus made this commandment. He gave this commandment 24 hours before he was to hang on the cross. So let's read that again because this is so important. I pray that every verse that we read today will become living uh, water will become oil, will become a sword in your spirit. I make a declaration and a decree, Holy Spirit, that you will do the work in us as individuals, that every word we read, that we will know that it is the truth, it is the way, it is the life. 
Thank you, God. This is my commandment. Yes, yes. That ye love one another as I have loved you. So he commanded them to love the way he loved. And so how did Jesus love? Look at verse 13. Greater love hath no man than this. That a man lay down his life for his friend. So he says, love the way I love. And the type of love that I have is that I will lay down my life for my friends. And in verse 14, he tells them exactly who his friends are. You are my phileos, my friends, if you do whatever I command you. Mm -hmm. So he says, you are my friends. So not only do I command you to love, but I command you to love the way I love, that I would lay down my life for my friends. And then just in case you weren't clear, you are my friends. Do you see that in the text? Yes. Now we're going to stay in this because not only did Jesus command to love 24 hours before he died, but he also commanded to love after he rose. And for that, we're going to be in chapter 21 today. John chapter 21. Come on, Holy Spirit. John chapter 21, as we lay this foundation. Hallelujah. Now, as we go to John chapter 21, Hallelujah. I want to look at verse 2 real quick. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus hmm, and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee mm -hmm. and the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples. So we see here that we're talking about an appearance of Jesus after the resurrection. Right. So after the resurrection, he appeared to his uh, disciples, to his apostles. And who were present again? Who was present? Help me focus, Jesus. What verse am I reading? Verse 2. Oh, y'all. There were together Simon Peter. There was who? Simon Peter. After the resurrection... Jesus appeared to the disciples, and who was there? Simon, Simon Peter. Peter. Remember that, okay? And Thomas, called Didymus. So, so Jesus appears after his death. 24 hours before his death, he commanded them to love. Then after he is hung on the cross, after he died, the first people that he appeared to is a denier and a doubter. God Almighty! Hey, glory! So you can't tell me that God will not show up in your life. He will show up in your life even if you deny him. He will show up in your life even if you doubt him. Preach, Pastor. Do you see it? Yes, I see it. Let's read There it. were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus. So the and first people that he named, the first people that saw Jesus after he was the first disciples that he appeared to were one who denied him and one who doubted him. But, but listen, the faithful were there also because he named them also. Nathaniel of Cana in uh -huh. Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples. Two other of his disciples. But he said, let's get the record straight. Whether you belong to me or not, you're going to see me. You're going to see me. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. And he just gave us a glimpse of that in the scripture. Look at verse 3. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They said unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately. And that night they caught nothing. It's very interesting because when Jesus shows up, you know, uh, Simon Peter, he was very outspoken. He was one who always had something to say. So when Jesus shows up, you know, uh, he says, I'm going to go fishing. It's very interesting because they were given instructions prior to that. Prior to that, Jesus had told them to go to Galilee and, and wait for him right. because he was going to come there. Matter of fact, I want to uh, show you this in the text real quick. Um, let's go to Matthew Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. Verse Just lost my place there. Let's go back to John. We're going to come to that. We're going to come to Matthew 26. Look at verse 30. Matthew 26 verse 30. It says, And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Mm-hmm. 
Then said Jesus unto them, all ye shall be offended because of me this night. Right. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, hallelujah, I will go before you into Galilee. Mm -hmm. Peter answered and said unto him, though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. So they, they were on a mission because Jesus had told them prior to his death, he said, I will meet you in Galilee. He says, I will go before you yeah. in Galilee. So that's where you're supposed to go. Yeah. Uh, look at verse 15. We're going to get back to the text. It's John chapter 21, verse 15. 21 and 15. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? So you see here, uh, Peter was actually out of place. Because he was supposed to go and wait for Jesus in Galilee, uh -huh. but he didn't, he didn't want to wait. He decided to return to something that was familiar to him. Yes. Right? So whenever we feel like we have lost our Savior, whenever we feel like we have lost that, we, we put our confidence in something, and when that confidence is shattered, when it feels like it's gone, then we have a tendency to return to that which is familiar to us, right? So Peter stands up, you saw it in verse 2, he stands up in the midst of everything that's going on, and he says, I'm going to go fishing. I'm going to do what I was doing prior to this whole Jesus experience, right? Now, I know he has shown up, and I know I have seen him, but I'm going to return to what I was doing before. Because at that time, Peter wasn't even sure, am I entertaining a spirit, or is this actual, the actual Christ, right? Yeah. So he says, you know what? I'm going fishing. And one thing about a leader, a leader has influence. If someone ever calls you a leader, they're telling you that you have influence. All authority means is that authority gives you influence in people's life. Now, when Peter said he was going fishing, who followed? Look at verse 2 again. There were together Simon Peter, the one that denied Jesus, and Thomas called Didymus, the uh -huh. one who... D doubted Jesus and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples. Uh, next verse. Simon Peter saith unto him, I go a fishing. They said unto him, We also go, we ain't going, you ain't going without us. So they went. They went forth and entered into a boat or a ship immediately. And that night they caught nothing. It's, it's funny how when we walk with the Lord and we say that we're going to go back and do what we used to do, we don't even have the anointing to do that anymore. Thank you, God. We don't have the ability to return to it anymore. Thank you, Jesus. And the scriptures say it's like a dog returning to his vomit, right? It's just not in us to do anymore. So what Peter says, that Peter says, you know what, let's go and do what we were doing before Jesus arrived. And then the rest of the, the, the apostles, they say, you know what, that sounds like a good idea. So if Peter is going, then we're going to. And the scripture said they caught nothing. nothing. God never told him to be a fisher of fish. He told Peter, you are a fisher of men. So why would you try to return to the natural when this thing Come is spiritual? On. Why would you turn to the natural when this Look at the Life next verse. Life is spiritual. What verse? Verse 4. 4. Mm. When, but when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Now, how long did they fish? Go back up to All verse 3. Uh, verse 3. Mm -hmm. All, and that night they caught nothing. They now, went fishing. That night. And all night they caught nothing. Right? Look at verse 4. But four. when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. When you read the Bible, don't read the words alone. Make what you're reading come alive in your mind so that you see it. Then your faith is activated. Mm -hmm. So like you should be seeing these, these dudes on this ship, on this boat fishing, and the, 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 um, there's the dawning of the day, and now Jesus is coming. Like, see that in your mind. Uh -huh. But when the morning was now come, 
Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Mm -hmm. So when the morning had come, after fishing all night, they haven't caught anything. Right. But the one who holds all the power now shows up. So he is on the shore. He's sitting on the beach. Can you imagine Jesus just sitting on the beach like, look, what are they doing? Look at them out there, right? So he calls to them. Listen to what he says in verse 5. Then Jesus said it unto them, children. Now, he says who? Children. Who's he talking to? Them he's talking to the he's talking to the denier. Yeah. And he's talking to the doubter. Yeah. He still sees you no matter what situation you find yourself in. He still takes the time to call you his, his child. Children. You yeah. see that in the text. Now the, the word there literally means when you look up that word, hallelujah, it literally is a metaphor for believers who are deficient in spiritual understanding. So he is speaking to those who are deficient in spiritual understanding. Because Pastor Gary said earlier, why are you going to the natural when this thing is what? Spiritual. We are not wrestling with people. This is a what? A spirit. Therefore, you have to annihilate in the realm of the what? Spirit. So he calls them children to let them know that they still belong to him. But he also calls them children to let them know that there's a maturity level that they have not reached yet. How can you walk with me for all that time? I, I told you about my death. I told you what would happen, but yet you still return to the natural. You have not matured in your mind yet. Therefore, you are a child. It is spiritual, y'all. It is spiritual. This thing is spiritual. We are spirit beings inside of what you call a lane. He's a spirit inside of what you call Gary. He's a spirit in what you call Minister Vic. So yes. the vessel has a name, but the spirit is either alive in Christ, alive to the flesh, or alive to the demonic. Mm. But you have to have spiritual discernment to know what you are dealing with. If we deal with things in the natural, he's going to continue to call us people who are, or believers, they were yes. believers, who are deficient in spiritual understanding. Look at verse 5. Then Jesus said unto them, children, have ye any meat? Listen to the question. Y'all ain't caught nothing, have you? Have you any meat? So what he is saying is, children, have you any substance? Have you any fulfillment? Maturity. Have you any nourishment? Yes. Have you fulfilled the task that you set out to do? Even in your disobedience, even in doing things your way, has it profited you Anything. That's what he's saying here in the text. When you decide to do it on your own, what have you gained? When Jesus asked a question, he is waiting Full on an answer. answer. And they answered him, no, we haven't caught anything. Listen, no, pie. we have no substance. We have no nourishment. We have nothing to sustain, sustain us. We have nothing. Now listen to the instructions of the master. And he said unto them, cast thy net on the right side. The right side is a place of authority where the pleasures forevermore are at his right hand. And he said unto them, cast the net on the right side of the ship. That's very interesting because Jesus is saying you left the position that I told you to be the in. The place of authority. You left the position I told you to be in, but now I need to make it right so that you know who I am. So in order to make it right, I got to tell you to cast on the right. In other words, get back to the proper position. Get back to your proper position. Hashtag get back to your proper position. I declare and decree in the name of Jesus that everyone under the sound of my voice in Jesus' name will get back into your proper position in Jesus' name. Whenever, we're, whenever we do something wrong in the natural, uh, we, we have this saying to say, I don't know, he just went left. You know, I don't know why he went to the left. For some reason, we always thinking that going to the left is the wrong is. position, right? right. Some, something just went left, right? So Jesus said, no, you need to go to the right. That's so he tells them to cast their, cast their nets in authority, right? Yes, yes. Listen, 
They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it because of the multitude of fishes. It's very interesting because Peter stood up as the leader of the disciples. This is the word of God. So, and as a leader, he had so much influence because he was so outspoken. So it's very interesting to me how Peter can stand in his authority, even after, even after denying Christ, he still holds that authority. My Lord. And he holds that authority. He denied Christ in the natural and in the spirit realm, yeah. right? But yet the people who followed after Peter originally followed him because he was a great fisherman, right? So they said, well, if Peter said he's going to go fishing, well, we I'm know sure. that he is good at fishing. Right. So they, so they said, well, first of all, you are our leader in the spirit realm, but you let us down when you denied Christ. So we're going to give you one more chance in the natural. We're going to follow you to go fishing. And even in the midst of fishing, he shows that he doesn't have the ability to catch fish anymore. In other words, Jesus is saying that in the spirit, I am your Lord. And in the natural, I'm still your Lord. You, have, you cannot do nothing without me. So it's, it's funny how Jesus said, Peter, you're supposed to be the expert at fishing, but yet... You can't even do that without me. We can do nothing without Christ. Come on, Holy Ghost. Verse 6 again. And he said unto them, Cast thy net on the right side of the ship, and you shall find. Mm -hmm. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Uh-huh. Next verse. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, it is the Lord. He straightens up. It's the Lord. It's him. It's funny. It's I like, hear him now. It's like, wait a minute, Peter. You're, you're, how can someone sitting on the bank tell you how to fish when you're the expert? So the person who's sitting on the bank must have authority that you don't have. So when, when they cast their net to the right side, then the disciples' eyes were open. And the one whom Jesus loved, John, says, you know what, Peter? He's a better fisherman than you. The very thing that you thought you were good at. The very thing. He's better than you. And who is that? That's Jesus. Jesus is better. When we study the book of Hebrews, the whole book of Hebrews is designed to say that Jesus is better. Jesus is better. Paul goes through a whole list of things to point out that Jesus is better. Let's continue. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, it is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked. And did cast himself into the sea. Mm hmm Continue. So, so he's so excited. He's like. <laughs> he's so excited. You know, it, it, it's amazing to me how we can be so spiritually minded that we're no earthly good. And we saw that he was no earthly good in doing something that he was supposedly good at, right? Not only was he no earthly good, but he was spiritually blind. That his friend, Lord. a fellow a uh, disciple, a fellow apostle had to point out to him, that's Jesus. Lord, have mercy. Sometimes we can be so high-minded that someone has to tell us, hey, that's, that's Jesus. Don't be so prideful that you won't let anyone point out Jesus to you. Sometimes we just can't see. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land. But as it were 200 cubits, dragging the net with the people them in it. We, we ain't going to let go of these fish now. <laughs> We've been out here all night. So we're going to bring the fish with us. Let's continue. At, wait, verse 9. Mm -hmm. As soon then as they were come to the land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid thereon in bread. He didn't prepare the meal. It, it, you know, it's funny because uh, when you look at the scripture, the last time Peter had an encounter with Jesus, he was standing by a fire with coals. 
he was standing by the fire warming himself. When, when someone says, the Jesus over there who is being, uh, you know, about to be crucified, do you know him? And Peter was like, I'm just warming myself by this fire. Not in my business. I, don't, I do not know the man. So he denied Jesus sitting by that fire, that campfire. He denied him three times. Now here it is. Jesus has prepared a campfire again. And who's the first one at the fire? Peter. And, yeah. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from the land. Hmm. But, but as it were 200 cubits, dragging the net with fishes. Yes. As soon, as soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, mm -hmm. and fish laid thereon and bread. So, so wait a minute. If they're bringing the fish in, fish and bread. then how did the fish get on the coals that were already prepared for them before they got there? So I told you earlier that Jesus was a better fisherman. So not only did he catch fish, he's already prepared the fish to feed the disciples. Since the day Jesus show up, showed come on, up, come on. he has been feeding come the on. disciples. Come on. He has been feeding them in the natural and feeding and, and, them in the spirit. So even after his resurrection, he is still carrying out that task to feed his disciples. Jesus saith unto them, bring up the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land full of great fishes. I just see him struggling. Like he is determined to bring, can you just, in my mind, in the movie in my head, he is pulling that um, dragnet of fish and he's struggling and hundred and fifty and three and for all there were so many yet was not the net broken hundred and fifty three fish an abundance of fish in shallow water mm -hmm. wow now let's continue Jesus said to them come and dine come y'all come on in here and get something to eat in my, in my movie, in my head, they're getting ready to eat Red Snapper. And none of them, none of the disciples durst ask him, who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. It's very, it's, very, it's very important that you see what's going on here in the text. Now, the last time they were together, Jesus broke bread yeah. and had a meal with them, right? Yeah. So now after his resurrection, we see Jesus doing the very thing he did before, right? right? right. He is breaking bread right. with the disciples. Right. Um, what verse, verse am I 14. on? 14. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples. After that, he was risen from the dead. So this is the third time. Right. And they, and they know who he is, right? So now after he's shown himself for the third time, this is a, what we were trying to get to here in the text, uh, <laughs> verse 15. So now we're going to read that Jesus challenges Peter's commitment or his loyalty. So this is about two weeks after the crucifixion of Jesus. So this is about two weeks later. So when they had dined, that was the men's breakfast, by the way, because it was the morning, remember? So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And he said to him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my lambs. It's very interesting that if you look at this, the first conversation that Jesus has with Peter is do you love me why did jesus ask that question let's go back to matthew chapter 26 matthew chapter 26 <laughs> matthew 26 let's start at verse 31 31 then said jesus unto them all ye shall be offended because of me this night for it is written i will smite the shepherd and the mm, 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 and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. So he says, because of me this night, some of y'all are going to be scattered, right? Now, we already said that Peter always had a lot to say. Now, drop down to verse 34. 34, Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, 
that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Look, I'm sorry, go back to uh, verse 33. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Basically what he was saying to Jesus is, listen, I hear what you're saying, and they may do it, but it ain't going to be me. It ain't going to be me. I don't, I don't know if you would consider Peter a friend or not, because he just, he just threw everybody else under the, under bus. the bus, right? He says, Lord, oh my God. they may deny you, but it will not be me. Verse 34. And Jesus said, verily I say unto you. Now, in the Bible, when you see that word verily, it means amen. So God is saying, I'm putting a period at the beginning of this sentence to let you know that it is so. So when you, say, when you see verily, it means amen. When you see verily, verily, that means amen, amen, showing up without a shadow of a doubt. I'm fit and ready to tell you the truth, and it is so. And now, I like how in verse 31, Jesus did not make it so personal. Right. Because he says, you will all fall away because of me this night. Yeah. But then Peter makes his bold statement. Right. And then we see here in verse 34 that Jesus now makes it more Hallelujah. personal, right? Now he now he directly calls him out. Look at verse 34. Verily I say unto thee that this night before the cock crow, you shall deny me three you. times. He said, now you all are going to fall away. But since Peter made such a bold statement, he says now he tells him about his falling away. He tells him exactly what's going to happen, right? Now you all are going to fall away, but since you have so much to say, Peter, I'm going to tell you exactly what your falling away will look like. He says, truly I tell you, this very night before the what rooster crows, yeah. you will deny me three, three times. times. Three. Three times. That's the number of divine completion. Peter said to him, though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Like he is, he's the all-knowing, all-powerful God. And he says, no, nah, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm not going to do it. And then everybody else agreed. I can't believe Peter has the boldness to tell the Lord that you are wrong. He tells the Lord, you don't understand my character. You have mischaracterized me. I would never do that to you. You know, people always say the Lord knows my heart. You're absolutely right. He, he does. does. He does know your heart, right? So he tells him that. Now go back to verse 15. Okay. So we're going back to John. 21 15. Mm -hmm. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And he said to him, Yea, Lord. So he says to him, Do you love me more than these? And then this is very important because he already knows, and Peter knows that he knows that he denied him. So it's like Jesus is asking us a question, and we're giving him an answer. But our actions don't line up with what we're saying because we did not stand boldly before him earlier. Now, it's very interesting that he calls him Simon. Now, there's a whole lot of commentary out there that says that he calls him Simon because oh, he had already fallen. Remember, before he was called Peter, he was called the rock. So now when Jesus comes back, he calls him Simon because you're no longer the rock. That's what some commentators say, but I don't know, because you, you can look throughout the text that Jesus referred to him, Simon, on many occasions. Right. But that's just some food for thought right. that I want to throw out there to you, right? But he, he, after he tells him, asks this question, he, he gives him some instructions, right? Look at the latter part of verse 15. He says, feed my lambs. He said, feed my lambs. Yeah. Now, what is a lamb? The lambs are the ones that are weak, the ones that are vulnerable, the ones that are immature. Immature. So we have lambs and we have sheep. So whenever we think of a lamb, we think of a baby sheep. We think of a young sheep, right? So he tells him to feed my lambs. In other words, you're older now, Peter. You should be wiser. I don't you, mind. you should understand how people have a youth. They have a zeal, but they need some guidance. They're not yes. mature yet, yes. right? So he's telling Peter... You have made some comments. You have said some things that didn't work out in your favor. But yet, I'm not throwing you away. I'm giving you an assignment. And your assignment is to feed my lambs. Yes. 
Feed those who are young. Yes. Feed those who are not quite mature yet. Yes. Don't, don't, don't get frustrated with them, Peter. Just feed them. If you love me. If you love me, feed them. So that word lovest, when he says Jonas, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me, that word means it's a Christian love. It's a love that proves um, that you have a desire for God's affection. And then that when he says, you knowest that I love thee, that word love is phileo. That is a deep, uh, that's a love that is, it's, it's a fond love. It's a, it's a depth of love. Mm -hmm. And verse 16 says, he saith to him again. The second time, Simon, son of Jonas, yes. agapeo, thou me, he saith unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I phileo thee. He saith unto him, feed my sheep. Now, he goes from lamb to sheep, right? So he tells him, uh, when he says uh, feed my uh, my lambs. He's talking to him about. God they may not understand the word, but you still have to feed them anyway. In other words, he's telling him you have to cause them to eat. You know, uh, you have to make sure that they eat. And then he switches up and he tells them to tend to my shepherd. So one translation says feed, but I mean sheep. He says tend to my sheep, right? So now when he says tend to my sheep, it's a little bit more responsibility. Come on. Not only do I, he's moving away from just putting some food down and making sure they eat. Now he says to tend to my sheep, which means that there's a more mature level Come of on. caring Come that on. needs to take place. Amen. Don't sleep on that, y'all. Don't sleep on that. There is a maturity that is supposed to happen um, with us. That at, at, at one time we can feed the lambs, then we need to feed the sheep. It's, it's, a, it's a bigger responsibility. I tell you what, uh, it's hard working with an old saint. I'll just tell you that right now. Tell the truth, Pastor Gary. <laughs> them old saints that have been sitting on them church pews for years. So he's telling people, those are the ones you got to tend to. You just, you just can't drop stuff down for them. No, they're going to need a little bit more of your time, a little bit more caring. Jesus. Those are the ones you have to go in and pull out and uproot some old stuff, some old religious habits that they're stuck with. You have to tend to them. Mm. So going to be a little, this is, this is not going to be quick here, Peter. You're going to have to put some time in for this one. Some of them are still saying that cleanliness is next to godliness. And that ain't even no scripture. <laughs> That's not in the verse. It's not there. Some of them are still quoting God helps those who help themselves. And they swear it's in the Bible. So those are the ones you got to tend to, Peter. You got to do some, you got you to do some uprooting. Hmm. It's hard to uproot an oak tree. But don't be weary in well-doing. Now remember, you see what's in the natural, but you're really dealing with a spirit of religion. The Pharisee spirit. Mm -hmm. You have to still love those ones, Peter. When it comes to tending to the sheep, it requires humility. Hallelujah. It requires you to have sacrifice. And it requires a service of you. That's what he's saying. In order to tend to the sheep, you must be humble. You must be humble for those who tell you you're wrong when you know you're right. God Almighty. And, and, and Peter, you should understand that because you, you said it to me. You told me I was wrong, Peter. So you should understand how to tend to sheep. Because Peter, let's be honest, you, been, you were with me for a long time. But it just didn't take. Oh, my goodness. So really, it doesn't matter if you've been in church 13, 14, 15, 16 years. You could still be a lamb. Or you can be an old, sh stubborn sheep. Or you might be a wolf. Mm. Because in the pasture, there are goats, there are sheep, and there are wolves. Judas, he still loved him. But he knew he couldn't trust him. 
So when he says tend to my sheep, he is telling him to take total care of the flock. Verse 17, he saith unto him the third time. Go to slide number, go to slide number four. I, I want to really bring out this number three. I don't want us to just read over it. The Hebrew word it, um, for three depicts seeds, it depicts trees, right. it depicts fruit. It's divine revelation. It's resurrection. It's gathering balance. It's uh -huh. an equilibrium. It's a pattern. It's a paradigm of how that person thinks. Um, it's a witness. It's strength. It means new life, sprouting, resurrection, fruitfulness, words of life. It means counsel. It means unity, the giving of the Torah and the spirit mm -hmm. and the foundation of the of the temple. That's us um, signifies the number three. Right. So it's a number that depicts divine illumination, divine completion, divine revelation. It depicts maturity in the Bible. You see the outer court, the inner mm -hmm. court and the holy of holies. God the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Death, resurrection. You see, all through the yes. scripture, it's, it, when you see three, it's like a, a, a stake in the ground. Mm -hmm. it, it's a, it sticks. It is. It, it means like, amen, it is. That's right. So he says, he denied Jesus how many times? Three. And Jesus asked him how many times? Three. That's right. So he says, I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to forgive you. That's and right. I'm going to give you an opportunity to re-say what you said when the cock was crowing. Mm -hmm. He said to Simon, he saith unto, verse 17, he saith unto him, listen, when you are wrong about something, yes. it would behoove us to say that I was wrong. I was wrong. That was not right, what I said, what yeah. I did. I am sorry. And it, the reason why it's so hard for some of us to say that we're sorry is because of the strength of pride that's resurrected in our loins. Wow. Lord have mercy. That's why it's so hard. Or they'll say, sorry. No. No, no, no. <clears throat> no, your heart was far from it. And stop telling your children to say that they're sorry. Because you're making them say something that they don't believe in their heart. Right. When, when I was in early childhood development, we would say, Johnny, did you hit, did you hit Sarah with the block? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you think about that? Well, she shouldn't have. Well, do you think that you should say something? No. Okay. You're not going to be able to go back to the block center. We, it's developmentally yes. inappropriate to tell the little boy to tell her sorry because he don't mean it. Because if she takes that mess away from me again, she's going to get clocked again. Because I said it because Miss Elaine told me to, but I didn't believe it. And that's the same thing with some of us. I'm so sorry. But sorry, but you shouldn't have. That's called pride. And that's what Jesus is getting at with Peter. That's why he's asking him this question so many times, right? Because, uh, Peter, let's face it. You, you're bold to say stuff. You're bold enough to say the first thing that comes to your mind, right? But I want to make sure that you have a heart change. I want to make sure that what you actually say, you actually believe. Yeah, it's a right? circumcision of the heart. The harder it is to say you're, and blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be, well, I didn't do nothing. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called, but they slapped me first. Blessed are the peacemakers, but they slept with my husband. Blessed are the peacemakers. They stole from me. Blessed are, put your cheek to the dust. Mm -hmm. Break it up. Like, I feel it right now. God, I pray that you break up that fallow yes, ground Lord. in our minds and in our hearts. In the name of the harder it is for us to say sorry, the stronger the spirit of pride lives on the inside of us. Mm -hmm. Look at verse 17. Oh, my God. He saith unto him the third time, Simon. So when he says it. unto him the third time, he says Simon. Yeah, right? Yeah. Now, when you look up the word Simon, yeah. you look up the meaning of Simon, Simon means to listen and to hear. So, so Jesus has said to him, he has said to him three times, listen and hear. Listen and hear. Listen and hear. So he, when you listen and hear, you assign meaning yes. 
to that and which is being said, and yes. you're assigning action yes. to it. So I just don't want you to hear me. I want you to assign meaning and application to what I'm saying. Because if you truly love me, then you would take on my character. Now, I'm known as the good shepherd. And what does the good shepherd do? He lays down his life to protect the sheep. So when he tells him, do you really love me? Then you should behave the way I behave. My Lord. Because you get ready to face some stuff, Peter. You get ready to face some, some young lambs. And you get ready to face some old sheep. Oh my. And I need you to have my character. I need you to have my character when you deal with them youngsters. And I need you to have my character when you deal with the old heads. In other words, Peter, you need to lay down your life, not take a life. <laughs> because the shepherd has a, he has a rod and a staff with yeah. him, right? Yeah. So he said, Peter, I don't need you to take that rod and, and Peter, smash somebody in the head with it. Sometimes you do need to. Lord have mercy. Because sometimes <laughs> they kick against the prick. Yeah. And so in the scripture, when they begin to kick against the prick, that, that farmer would just take that, that, that staff and just jab him a little bit to get them back in the right space. You know, when I look at Peter, he was very outspoken. He always said what was on his mind. But I don't think that's why he was elevated to leadership. Okay. I think he was elevated to leadership because Peter carried a knife. He carried a sword with him, right? And he was quick to he cut her ear off in a minute, right? <laughs> so... So I dare, people, people are like, no, that's, that's Peter, you know, leave, leave Peter alone. Leave Peter alone because he will cut you quick. But Jesus, but Jesus is trying to tell him all that stuff you have in the natural, your sword, your ability to catch fish, it's nothing without me. Nothing without me. Look at verse 17 again. Sister Felicia Hollis, my mentor, used to call me Peter sometimes. And I didn't really know who Peter was. And then when she taught me who Peter was, I was offended. Because in my mind, I'm like, well, if they wouldn't act stupid, then I wouldn't have to go off on them. Because they're older than me in the spirit. Why are they doing this? And they just said in their scripture that this and this. She said, baby, that's foolish. With loving kindness have I drawn That's right. Me. That's right. Yeah. Um, Verse 17. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest phileo thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, phileo thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I phileo thee. And Jesus said unto him, feed, provide for, nourish my sheep. Now, when you read this text, uh, you, you might get an indication that uh, Peter was grieved at Jesus. N no, you shouldn't read it like that. Peter was grieved because he knew who he was, right? Peter was grieved because he knew he had failed Jesus. And Peter was grieved because no matter what answer he gave, he finally gave the right answer. My Lord. He, he didn't say a yes like he did the first two times. Yes. This time he changed his answer. He changed his response and he recognized the, the omniscience of God. He recognized who he was talking to when he simply said, you know all things. It was like he, he, he finally he surrendered. Yes. He finally surrendered and said, you know all things. You know, Lord. Let me write that on the side of my scriptures. He surrendered. He says, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. He surrendered. So, so I loved you the first time. But you knew that when it came to protecting my life against your life, I, I love my life too, Jesus. So he says, so that's when Jesus said, when it, when it comes between you putting your life on the line for me, Peter, you will deny me three times. So now he comes back and he wants to know, do you really love me? And he asked the question three times. And then finally Peter says, you're asking me a question that you already know no, the, the answer, answer to. to. And finally he accepts his answer and he says, feed my sheep. He says it again, right? A lot, Are you of, times, a lot of times when a wise person asks you a question, they already know the answer. 
And then when you give the wrong answer, a wise person will just smile and nod because they know that you are not ready to, what do you say? Surrender. Not ready to surrender. So Peter was not distressed with Jesus. He was grieved because of his own sin. Many times we're not upset with Jesus. We're grieved because of our own sin. We grie we're grieved because of the conditions of our own heart. Now, one of the things I want to point out to you is that all this is taking place in the presence of the other disciples. The apostles are there, right? Oh, wait, babe. Hold on, babe, babe mm -hmm. Pastor Jerry. That word did not stick out to me until you just said it right now. That word grieved in verse 17, it says Peter was grieved. Yes. So I just right now just looked up the word grieved in the Strong's Concordance, and it means to make sorrowful. It means the effect of sadness. Uh -huh. It means to throw into sorrow. It means to be made uneasy. It means to cause him a scruple. Wow. Well, what's that mean? So I typed in scruple, and this is what it means. A feeling of doubt or hesitation with regard to the morality due to a course of action. Mm -hmm. So when he was grieved, it, he, it was a check in his morality. Wow. In what he did. Yeah, I love them. Yeah, I love them. Oh, my God, maybe, maybe I didn't. Now, all this is taking place in the presence of disciples. And what's actually happened in this text, I don't want you to get it twisted. Jesus is restoring Peter. Jesus. So each time he asked him a question, Jesus is not necessarily focusing on Peter's love for him. What he is actually doing is getting Peter ready for the task at hand. God. So he's asking Peter, do you love me? And then he tells him, if you love me, then you will tend to my lambs. If you love me, you will tend to my sheep. If you love me, you will shepherd my sheep. So I'm not necessarily focused on your love for me. I'm focused on your love for other people, that you will love them the way I love you. And that goes all the way back to uh, John chapter 15 when he says, this is my commandment for you, that you love one another, right? So he's telling him, he's taking him all the way back to prior to my 24 hours prior to my death, I commanded you to love. And I command you to love the way I love, that I will lay down my life for my friends. So now here I am asking you these three questions again to see if you're willing to lay down your life for the sheep. Gosh, man. He said, I'm not asking you to lay down your life for friends. I'm asking you to lay down your life for those who are in the sheepfold. I'm asking you to lay down your life for fellow believers, right? And, and even in the laying down your life, it's not a laying down your life into death. Right. It's committing your life to them. It's commitment of love to them, right? That's called, remember when we learned about the spiritual house, that word house, oikos, and it means ecology. Ecology is the relation of organisms, that's us, in regards to one another. So you have the spiritual house, that's us, because he's the cornerstone. We're the living stones. That word um, house is oikos. It means ecology. Ecology is how we uh, affect one another. And then the word after ecology is economy. So if there's not a good, if I'm a business owner, if I don't have good ecology, that's why when you walk into, into the store, they say, hi, welcome to Walmart. Because they know the ecology will bring forth the economy. Do you understand? So he's saying treat the people right so that we can continue to build the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And so and kingdom people are not poor people. Ecology, oikos, love so, my sheep and my lamb. That's right. So Peter was grieved because of his own arrogance. God. He was grieved because of his own pride. He was grieved, as they say back home, because his mouth wrote a check. What, babe? That he just couldn't catch. He couldn't catch it, right? So he was grieved, right? So now Jesus has to restore him, but not only does he want to restore him, but he wants to restore him in the presence of those who look up to okay. him. So he says, Peter, you were, you were stripped of your spiritual authority. Oh you were stripped of your ability to, to carry out things in the natural, but now I'm going to restore you in the presence of your fellow 
uh, comrades. And that's one of the things that we must learn to do as leaders. As leaders, they tell you to praise openly, but rebuke privately. So now he, he is asking Peter this question because, listen, when he told Peter he was going to deny him, that happened. He did deny him. But now Jesus said, now you must be restored. And not only must you be restored, but everyone must see your restoration. My Lord. Now look at what uh, verse 18. Verse 18, I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation. I tell you the truth. When you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you want to go. Now, look at verse 19. Jesus said this to let him know by what kind of death he would glorify that by what kind of death he would glorify God. Then Jesus told him, follow me. Wow. If, if you're Peter, you just heard a mouthful right there. Uh, first of all, the good news is that you're going to live to be an old man. Yep. <laughs> he did However. tell him that, right? However, uh, you're going to glorify me in your death, right? And uh, if you look at this text very closely, this is so good. <clears throat> Jesus is telling Peter, that you too will be crucified. Just like Jesus was crucified, he's telling Peter that he will be crucified. Listen to what he said. He says that, look at verse 18. I tell you the truth. Listen to this, y'all. Be careful how you treat people. Because when you get old, you might need people to put some shoes on you and wash your hind parts and put clothes on you. Be careful. I tell you the truth. When you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress and take you where you don't want to go. Now, when you study the Old Testament and uh, you look up these words, when it talks about the stretching out of the hand, he's talking about the stretching out of your hands for the crucifixion. So notice where he's telling him that when you're older, your hands will be stretched out. You will be crucified. But have no fear that he spoke this saying that I will be glorified. You will be glorified. In your death, right? So follow me. So follow me. I think a lot of us sometimes, we don't want to hear about the dying part. Right, Pastor Gary. We don't want to hear about this sacrifice you know we want to we it's easy for us to hear how jesus sacrificed but we don't want to talk about that we rather argue about other things the type of things we rather, we rather argue about are found in luke chapter 22 let's go there real quick luke That's chapter so 22 good. got real quiet yes we love you jesus but we ain't ready to die for you but the good news is jesus has not called us to die for him because he has already died for us what he has called us to do was go forth and spread the gospel. He gave us the great commission, right? So we need to die to our flesh. Luke chapter 22, these are the types of things that we rather argue about. Luke 22, look at verse 24. And there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. Mm -hmm. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called Benefactors. So they're having an argument. The disciples are having an argument upon themselves. Which one of us will be the greatest? And Jesus wants to set the record straight. Look at verse 26. But you shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger. And he that is chief, as he that doth serve. Now when he says let him be as the younger, the younger sibling always serve the elder. Yeah. So he says that if you truly want to be great, then you must behave as a younger, uh, not as, a, as someone who just sits back. Verse 27. For whether is greater he that sitteth at meat or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat, but I am among you as he that serveth. So Jesus is saying that you think that people are great because they have the choice seat at the table. He said, though, even though I have a choice seat at the table, 
I am a servant. And you know, if you, if you go back and study, even in the book of John, prior to all of this stuff happening, the first thing that Jesus did was he got a towel and he girded himself with the towel, right? And he washed their feet, right? Now, who didn't want the feet washed? <laughs> and then he changed his mind and he's like, oh, well, wash my whole body. Yeah. He, he, he didn't want his feet washed. He's like, no, Lord, you, you're, you're, you're too much of a king to wash my feet. And Jesus said, if you don't want me to wash your feet, then you have nothing to do with me. And then he said, okay, wash everything. Wash my whole body. Sometimes we have a habit of just speaking things ahead of time. We, too, are like the lambs. But if we don't get correction as a lamb, then we're going to become an old, stubborn sheep. You're still going to be loved by the shepherd, yeah. but you're just making things harder for yourself. One of the things that when we started this church, one of the things that we said in our slogan is transforming minds, saving lives. We believe that the doctrine that we teach will transform your mind and save your life. But you have to be willing to be shepherd. Yeah. Let me say that again. Yeah. You, have you have to be willing to, to be, be shepherd. shepherd. I know that Pastor Gary and I have had a conversation before, and I was saying there's a difference between having a church home and having a shepherd. That's, that's two different things. Some people say, oh, yes, I go to the church, but I don't let the leadership tell me what to do because God tells me what to do. Then you don't want to, your soul to be watched over. You just belong to a church, and that's the first step, Peter. But you've got to surrender. Let's go back to John uh, chapter 15 real quick as we close this out. John 15. John 15, verse 12. John 15, verse 12. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. The very commandment that Jesus gave before he was crucified is still the same commandment that we're to walk in, that we love one another. How should we love the way we were loved? Did you enjoy this lesson today? <laughs>